Hello, everybody, and welcome to my Linux Security Summit talk about patch attestation. My name is Konstantin Rabitsev. I am in charge of kernel.org infrastructure at the Linux Foundation. I've never done anything like this before. I'm not a professional recorder, so I hope it works out. Um, there probably will be some awkward moments when I'm rapidly trying to fix or switch between windows, so hopefully there will be a few of them and not too many. All right, uh, so let's get to the topic of our presentation, which is uh, patch attestation with Patat. Patat is the tool I wrote, and before we talk about the actual tool, let's go and look at what the state of patch attestation is without it. So RFC 2822 attestation for mailed in patches. What options do we have these days? Um, there's two mechanisms of doing it. There's an end-to-end, -end, which means it's developer to developer, developer to maintainer. You sign the patches on your workstations. The developer who reviews them uh, verifies them on their workstation. Or there is the main level, meaning you don't do anything on your workstation. You submit it to your SMTP server. The SMTP server signs it using uh, the DKIM standard, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the developer basically does nothing to verify it because all the verification is done by your receiving SMTP server. And and uh, if it, the DKIM signature doesn't match, chances are the mail ended up in spam anyway and you didn't see it. So for end-to-end -end, uh, attestation, there's two mechanisms. There's OpenPGP and then there's SMIME. OpenPGP is uh, about as old as each other. OpenPGP was introduced, I believe, late 80s or early 90s. I don't remember which one it is. But in the ensuing 50, no, not 50, 30 years of life, it didn't really solve the problem of key distribution because key distribution and bootstrapping trust is really a hard problem. And there is no easy sidestepping of that problem. Like we can create a certification authority, but then you have to trust certification authorities. Obviously, if you don't want to trust anybody, then uh, you have to worry about key distribution and management on your own and that is the crux of the problem another problem with openpgp is that the uh, mail client support is still subpar there are still many mail clients that do not support openpgp uh, or there are those that do support it but uh, don't do it on the uh, sort of the, the the mobile application or anything like that anyway if you've ever tried to use openpgp with uh, ver signing messages and verifying messages you know that they it's hard to get it configured right and it's hard to get the tooling to do the right thing when sending and receiving mail now, SMIME is, is another standard for doing the same thing as OpenPGP signatures, but it really is relegated these days to the corporate world. Uh, there used to be um, public certification authorities that would provide you an SMIME certificate for signing a mail, but uh, there used to be uh, two of them two years ago. Now it's just only one that does this, and they do it in a really strange fashion. If you try to, to get a certification certificate from them for signing a mail, they will send you the certificate, the public key, and the private key, which is totally not how it's supposed to work. So I don't recommend you use them because that's kind of really sketchy. Anyway, um, there are vendor-specific end-to-end mechanisms for signing and receiving and, and verifying mail, Proton Mail, Tudanata, but they are all within the vendor itself. They don't scale outside, so we are not going to talk about them at all. So the main level verification is DKIM. Um, let's take a look at that uh, in a moment. So patches on OpenPGP. Can we use current OpenPGP standards for signing and verifying patches? Well, yes, but uh, nobody does it because there are important problems with it. One, it breaks code review. Uh, if you use the inline attestation, um, it, it, you, I think you've seen some of that. There is going to be dash, 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 begin PGP sign message, dash, 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 then the body of the patch, then there is dash, 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 begin signature, and then there is the, the base64 encoded signature of the, of the, of the, uh, at, the, at, the very end, bleh, at the very end of the message. And you, uh, the problem that it introduces, and it's not just those headers and footers, but also the fact that if there are any double dashes in the message body itself, it will add a dash space before that to the, so it doesn't get confused where the actual signed content starts and ends. And that, of course, becomes a problem because Git itself uses triple dash as a mechanism for logical separation of, of commit content. So there can be anything that's above the triple dash goes into commit. Anything that's below the triple dash is just uh, auxiliary information for the developer to, uh, to review uh, the patch. For example, it can contain history of the patch. It can contain the short log, any sort of information that uh, the maintainer may find useful, but not preserve in the actual commit. So that, if it's in the inline sign message, there will 
get turned into dash space dash 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 and tooling will probably just choke on that believe me so mime based attestation is a way to solve this problem ish um, by default it does not sign subject it is not in, the signatures do not include the header metadata like subject and from and date and that does go into the git commit so this is the information that we really kind of want to be included in main in, in the signature so we are um there are ways of doing it with git you can you can copy the 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 subject and you copy the date and copy the from into the body of the message and git will look at that but almost no tools do this and um it, it continues to be a problem and of course the uh, mail user agents and archivals and everything that can strip the signatures i've seen this happen all the time that don't recognize that the pgp signature is a trusted and valid content they may quarantine it or do anything like this so the uh, smtp relays may may cause problems verifying this also it does not s attempt to solve key distribution we're not going to talk about it too much there is a web key directories that sort of uh, stepped up to try to solve this problem but it continues to persist DKIM attestation is created to combat spammers, really. So when gmail.com sends an email to you, it wants the, uh, to, to, uh, to verify to, to your receiving client to verify that the mail actually came from gmail.com, just so the spammers don't uh, pretend to be uh, anybody from a large uh, company like Microsoft or, or Google or, or Facebook and, it, and so forth. So Google and Microsoft and Facebook will, will add a signature, the, um, the DKIM-signature header that will contain um, information about the message, including the body hash, and it will sign it with a private key. And to get the public key, you have to query DNS to retrieve it uh, at a specific, uh, a specific uh, domain record. It covers the, it's actually pretty good. It covers the header metadata. Um, it, it says the, there's an H equals, which includes, which lists which headers are included in the signature. It includes the body hash, which is actually the entire body uh, canonicalized, and then that's this, that's the hash of the body. And then the the actual signature includes all the data that precedes um, the B equals. Uh, characters in the header so they will include the body hash will include the headers and then uh, it, the the actual header content will be part of the signature so it it, it really is pretty cool it's an open standard um, it is widely used it's, it's easy to implement um, so it is I think we should rely on this to a certain degree so is DKIM good enough to attest patches uh, it is but with a few caveats um, you know nothing about the infrastructure doing the signing right if it's a small developer uh, mom and pop shop, you, you probably don't, their the key's probably not on an HSM anywhere. It's probably somewhere in the, on the main server that is doing mail processing, accessible to the postfix or so whatever mail uh, uh, transfer agent that is doing all of the signatures. So if that server is compromised, then all of the email you know, is suspicious after that because you don't know if the key was uh, stolen or anything like that. Uh, the DNS zones, when you're looking up the public key, you're doing a DNS query. Of course, uh, DNS zones are still not signed. The vast majority of them isn't. Uh, even if they are signed, the DNSSEC is turned off verification for most of the, very, for most of the um, systems that are trying to perform the verification. So, uh, kind of, you hope that nobody's done anything nasty for your DNS lookup, but you can also never be sure about that. Now the problem is that the relaxed body canonicalization. So if you look at the uh, the C equals relaxed relaxed, that tells you that the body was canonicalized using the relaxed standard. And relaxed standard, one of the things that it does, it will kind of collapse all the multiple white space into a single space. Uh, not a problem for patches for languages like C or or Perl or anything like that, but for uh, languages with syntactic white space like Python, obviously this is is going to be a problem because um, a return true with a different indent could, could return you from a verification function and that will be a nasty vulnerability. So we can't really uh, rely on DKIM, at least when it's not using the relaxed standard uh, for canonicalization to really attest patches because it doesn't quite do it for us. It's better than nothing. Uh, if you look at the tools that I provide before, for example, it will use uh, DKIM verification all the time, regardless if it's simple or relaxed canonicalization, because simply it's better than nothing, uh, nothing at all. So we can, I suggest that we adopt DKIM for our purposes. We're going to use the standard almost in its exact form. We're going to twist it slightly. We're going to, uh, um, instead of canonicalizing the body um, using the relaxed 
or, or, or simple canonicalization, we'll first going to pass it through git mail info. And git mail info, one of the things that it does, it will look for things like a from or a subject in the body of the message to substitute its own from and subject. It will look at the same for date. It will, uh, it will uh, parse the uh, metadata of the message and the commit message and the patch and prevent, present them separately so we can actually see how Git sees them. So we're going to take this information that Git mail info provides us. Then we're going to canonicalize using it simple. And then we're going to not use the DNS for key distribution, but we are going to use our own key rings. And I will talk slightly about that in the future. And we're going to use OpenPGP instead of RSA or ED259 directly because it just makes sense for us for, as a kernel development community because we already are using um, OpenPGP quite extensively for a lot of other things. So this is the example with OpenPGP SHA-256. We used OpenPGP for actual signatures. We used SHA-56 for creating the hashes of, of the, the body and each of the, each of the headers. You, you'll notice that it looks exactly almost like the DKIM signature. There are minor differences there um, that, for example, we include uh, the length of the message. I won't mention why. There's reasons for that. You can read the code to figure it out. Um, there is, we would say, we only, uh, we only include the from and the subject headers. Not, we don't care about any other headers because they don't become part of the git commit, so we can ignore them. And uh, we, the B content is the output of Open PG, of GNU PG specifically um, that we include in, um, uh, in direct form, and that includes the date of the signature. We can't actually use the date header from 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 the email itself, because interestingly, Git send email will change the date to the latest. So if we sign it and then pass it through Git send email, the date header will stop validating. I have no idea why it works this way. It's really maddening, but there are probably reasons why it's this way. But so we're not going to sign the date header, but we do include the date of the signature in in the OpenPGP um, standard itself. So we do check those to make sure nothing untoward is happening. Okay. So skipping to, we're obviously not going to do it by hand. I propose that we do it with a tool I wrote called Patat. Silly name, serious business. It means potatoes in a lot of uh, languages, and I fully appreciate that. And apparently in Norwegian, it means false, which is really strange to me, but it just happens to be that way. It doesn't really matter. You can clone it from gitkernel.org. There's a URL right there. You can clone it from GitHub. That's your thing. You can be from there. You can just install it from pip uh, with PyPI using pip install patat. It's there. Um, it's really only a few hundred lines of code. And of course, we don't do our own crypto. We just rely on GNUPG and on Pineacle um, if, if we support the ED259 key directly. I won't mention those in this presentation because we're trying to keep it short. Uh, it is for Python 3.6. Uh, it's the earliest, the latest, the oldest Python version still supported. It is intended to be used via uh, sort of you set it up once and then you forget that it's there. It's invoked via send email validate. So if you do use git send email, the idea is that you will enable, you configure patat once and enable it via the hook. And after that, you, all the patches are just going to be automatically signed before you, uh, you don't even have to think about it twice before doing it. And I think everybody should sign their patches because why not? It's just an extra header. All should sign. I'm going to have a demo session. Uh, this is sort of the overlook of how it's going to work. You can install it on your own and test it out, or you can just follow me right here. I'm going to switch to the terminal. There we go. And I already have Patat pre-installed. It's the latest version as of today, maybe later when you're playing with it. And I already cloned um, the Linux repository here, and I created a commit that you can... Um, we can look there and it pretends that we just released a uh, kernel 600 that's it, it's not don't don't yeah don't think too much about this so let's do git format patch patch once to doubt take a look at this commit uh, this is the what uh, the patch looks like it's really very short i just changed the uh, version and patch level to 60 now how do we make this uh, signed with patat? Well, first of all, I already have a PGP key generated. Just to, for the purposes of this example, it's right there. Uh, it's got the signature subkey, ed25519. We can use that directly. So let's say git format patch one, which is pipe it straight. Wait, before we do this, I'm just going to show you my git config. Just so we have the signing key right there, just what you would use for assigning PGP, uh, signing uh, git commits um, uh, directly. 
So this is the same, it's user.signing key is specified. If that's specified, then Patat already knows how to find the key that you want to use for your development work. So we're going to do format patch one standard out, and I'm going to pass it directly to Patat sign. And if we look at the output here, you will see that uh, we gained two developer signature, developer key headers. The developer signature contains the information about the, uh, the the actual attestation. It's got the signature. It's very short because we use the EDT59 key. Uh, the developer key is really for the purposes of just information. We don't use uh, the information directly from this header to verify the key, uh, verify the signature, because that would be silly, obviously, because we don't carry we don't trust the contents directly from the same message we're trying to verify but if you are interested in how to import this key into your keyring or do any other work about it this is information that you will need to obtain it right so it's got the identities patata example.org it's an open pgp key the fingerprint is right there so you sh theoretically should know how to retrieve that from a key server or how to ask the this person for the public key that might go into it right here so we can pass it straight to patat ver validate, right? Because it's our own key. We already have the public key for it. It says the pass. If there's anything about the body or the headers that were signed that was different, we would have gotten a bad say. So obviously we don't want to pass all the format patch to, 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 to patat sign. So let's just enable the uh, hook. And there's a convenient command to do this, uh, install hook. You'll say that it installed the send email validate hook. If we look at the contents of that, you will see that it's just uh, literally just one command, patat sign dash dash hook, and then just whatever is the um, hook gets on the um, as an argument. And after this, so let's say get format patch one, let's say O to send. See, we created that patch. We will now do uh, git send email. And I say dry run because we don't want to annoy anybody. And I would say to send star, right? And you already here see that patat was already invoked. It was signed. And if we control C now, if we look at the message as it exists on disk, you will see that there is a signature header present there. So let's say uh, test local host because it doesn't really matter for dry run. Uh, what do you want? There we go. Um, and if we look now, if this wasn't a dry run, it would have just gone out. But if we look at um, uh, two sand one, you'll see that the headers were added, even though they weren't there before. This was done by the hook. So any patch that we now generate with format patch, and then we send with git send email, will automatically get those signatures, and we wouldn't have to really worry about patad invoking it manually or doing anything like that. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so you signed, you sent the patches. How is the maintainer supposed to verify this patch that, that, that it uh, hasn't been tampered? Well, tools like B4 will do it automatically for you. So let's get uh, Case Cook is a good person who is doing uh, using Patat for all this signing. So we're going to just demonstrate it right here. So we're going to retrieve his uh, message that he sent a few days ago. And is uh, you can see that B4 will do two attestation verifications. One, it will verify that DKIM signatures are correct, and we can see that they are correct here. The DKIM signatures passes, but it will tell me that there is no key to verify case cook at chromium.org, so I don't have it in my key ring. Now I could ask case to send me the key and import it into my key ring, right? GPG import. Or there is a way to deal with this other ways. There is a repository that I provide on kernel.org that I track, I call it the kernel.org keyring. And you will have to trust me. Unfortunately, there's no way around it. I, like I said, bootstrapping trust is hard. So if you want to trust me, you can just clone that repository and use it with before. I mean, look at git config and say, for keyring, look at this repository that we just cloned. And this is, uh, the, the URL will be in the presentation. And you can see that there's a dot keyring. And if we're doing a keyring, Open PGP, chromium.org, key case cook, and there is a default key that points to the one that we have on file for case cook. So now that we have this uh, keyring SRC there, right, we're going to rerun the same command before am, 
And you will notice that now B4 says, oh, well, we already have the key in the key ring, not the OpenPGP key ring, not the GNUPG key ring on disk, but we used the, the key ring that is in the repository. And there, that key matches and the signature passes, and we can just say this got signed by casecook at chromium.org. And this tells us that after the message was sent by case, uh, via all the SMTP servers, via you're gonna have to get stored on lower kernel.org, anything else that's been done to it, we can still verify that it has not been modified between when case sent it off and when um, we retrieved it. All right, switching back to slides. Let me go back here. This is what we did. Uh, the keyring management is still kind of nascent. I'm not going to go into it too much. I'm just going to mention how it works briefly. Uh, there will be a command for B4 that will allow you to simplify management of the keyring. Currently, the only thing it does, it can show you the keys that were used for signing a particular message uh, thread. So test that out by yourself if you want. So before we'll use a global GNU PG keyring. So if you already have a bunch of keys in your keyring, you don't really need to worry about reimporting them for before use. But we'll always look in the keyring, GNU PG keyring, if we don't find the key elsewhere. But what I suggest is that we stick pub keys into the Git repositories themselves, right? It's not as crazy as it sounds, right? The there's it is a bit of a circular. How do you use the Git repository to verify the Git repository itself? But the <laughs> distributed trust is hard and this kind of allows us to sub sidestep the problem uh, git repositories are distributed they're also auditable you can uh, for kernel.org we have uh, the audit trail for all the git commits so if there's something bad happens you can know uh, we, we can look at the uh, the audit trail and figure out who added which key where at which point uh, we can uh, the git commits themselves can be signed and verified so for example if if there's a maintainer maintaining uh, with a bunch of sub maintainers or a bunch of c contributors that that they work with they can verify um they can verify their own signature on the git commits it'll be one person that's kind of acts like a, as an introducer to all of the other people who are working with that sub maintainer um this is a hard problem keyring management and key management and it's it, it's complicated so i don't want to bog everybody down too much so i just wanted to point out that if you do have um the key in your GNU PG keyring, you don't really have to do anything else. It will be automatically used. It will be automatically verified um, if, if, if B4 finds the uh, patches signed with that key. Now, sub-maintainers can keep their own keyrings in a separate uh, ref in a repository. Uh, for example, if you have, uh, if you're a sub-maintainer of a specific driver and you work with 10 contributors who send you patches for the drivers all the time, you can just create your own ref and there's information for patat or before you can look into it how to how it's done and you can create your own refs like ref refs meta keyring and you can just keep their keys there for before to use this is a way to sort of centralize your keyring management so if you have copies of the repository in other places it's easy for you to not have to re-import the keys in a bunch of other places you can use the curl.org keyring like i've just demonstrated with my uh, with my example or you could use a, a fall through combination of all of the above. You know, before we'll look into any keyring SRC that you specified before it looks in your in your GNUPG keyring. So you can uh, play around with it. I, I recommend that you do this. This is this is kind of uh, I think a cool idea that uh, allows us to simplify key public key management for contributors and for our sub maintainers. So whose keys should be added to the project keyring? Uh, it doesn't really make sense for one-off contributors, obviously. So if there's somebody sent you a patch that you've never worked with this person before, uh, you, you can just always, you should always assume this, the code is malicious and you should be reviewing with extra zeal, right? But uh, maintainers don't really scale. So if there's somebody that you work with on, a, on an ongoing basis, day in, day out, right? You want to uh, be able to sort of have a s quick way to verify that the patches that they sent actually did come from them, from this particular person, that they haven't been tampered with uh, and root anywhere. So uh, this, the keyring as per management as proposed by Patat and before allows you to, uh, to add this as an extra sort of protection around your workflow. Um, doesn't say you should stop being vigilant, constant vigilance as always, but uh, yeah, just keep uh, keep this as an option, especially if you work with a whole bunch of different contributors and you want to make sure that the patches you receive are coming straight from them. Thank you. Questions or comments, send them to tools at linuxkernel.org. Um, patches are welcome. If you, if you use Patat and you find that it doesn't do something that you need or before or anything like that, if you do sign the patches, I will get warm and fuzzies, uh, so I will feel very good about that. So please feel free to do that. And that really is all there is to say about it. So 
thank you very much for uh, being part of this talk. I believe there is questions and answers you can ask me in the chat. I actually have no idea how it works. I hope that somebody introduced this um, topic and uh, please ask away or you can find me and uh, on the mailing list or um, hanging around. Thank you very much. Have a good day.